Hello everybody, welcome back to um, class. Okay, so today we're going to attack chapter 19, okay? And chapter 19 is about um, assisting with hygiene, personal care, skin, and the prevention of pressure ulcers. I know we just spoke a little bit about pressure ulcers a little bit ago, uh, so this is a continuation of. So I'm going to be reading off of some of my notes that I have here. Um, so let's do a little um, overview on skin. Um, so let's talk about the structure of skin. Um, the integra integumentary system contains the skin, the hair, nails, sweat, and sebaceous glands. The skin is the largest organ of the body. Please make a note of that. The skin has two main layers. It has the epidermis and it has the dermis. The epidermis is also called the stratum corneum, and the dermis is called the corneum. Okay, so let's talk about the epidermis. That is the outer layer, and it consists of stratified squamous epithelium, and it does not contain blood vessels at all. It contains melanin, um, and it and the melanin absorbs light and it protects against UV violet rays. Melanin is also called stratum corneum. Stratum corneum. The um, epidermis receives nutrition by diffusion from vessels and underlying tissues. Diffusion is the moving from an area of greater concentration to an area of uh, lower concentration. Um, I know some of you guys who've taken anatomy, physiology, chemistry, you know, um, even just some regular biology courses kind of can remember a little bit of that. The bottom layer um, contains melanocytes that secretes melanin, which determines um, our skin color. So the more melanin, the darker your skin, okay? Okay, so and the dermis is made up of dis, dense content, uh, connective tissue that gives us the strength and its elasticity. The inner layer um, of dense connective tissue are, is also called the stratum corneum, and it contains blood vessels, nerve glands, um, fibroblasts, uh, base, and it is also the base of the hair follicle. The nails are derived from the epidermis. And the sebation glands secrete an oily um, substance called sebum. The sweat glands um, secrete sweat, exactly what it says, sweat glands. The fibroblast produce new cells to heal your skin after an injury has occurred to the skin. And let's talk about the function of the skin. Why do you have it? Why do you need it? Um, there are four main functions when it comes to your skin. Number one, it's to protect. Number two is for sensation. Number three um, is for temperature regulation. And number four is for um, excretion and secretions. So let's talk about the protection first. It is the first line of defense against bacteria and other Organisms, it protects against thermal, chemical, and mechanical injury. Um, and also, sebaceous glands make the skin waterproof. So that's how it protects the skin. Um, for sensation, it contains sensory organs for touch, pain, heat, and cold. For temperature regulation, it regulates temperature by constricting and or dilating blood vessels and achieving or inactivating sweat glands by activating or inactivating sweat glands. Um, that's how it regulates through uh, temperature regulation. Now for the last function, which is the secretion and excretion, the sweat glands help to maintain the homeostasis of fluid and electrolytes. The sweat glands serve as an organ of excretion and secreting nitrous waste. Sweat glands in the axillae under your arm and external genitalia 
secretes fatty acids and proteins. Now, okay, yeah. So also dealing with the excretion and secretion uh, function of the skin, the sebum lubricates the skin and the hair. Sebum also keeps the structures uh, pliable and elastic. Sebum, sebum decreases heat loss and it decreases bacterial growth. Now let's talk about some changes that occur in the skin as patients are aging. There is a loss of elastic fibers and it causes the skin to wrinkle and to sag. A loss of collagen fiber also is a change and that causes the skin to become thinner, more fragile, and slower to heal. As the person ages, their skin will have a decreased sebaceous activity levels and that will leave the skin feeling more dry and more itchy. And the temperature control is also altered by decreased sebaceous uh, gland activity and the thinner skin. The hair becomes thinner as aging happens. It may grow more slowly and it will lose its color from loss of melanocytes. Okay, so for hygiene, um, we like to talk about pressure ulcer risk when we're dealing with hygiene. So let's talk about what hygiene is. Hygiene is the practice of cleanliness that is conducive of health. The practices affected, are affected by socioeconomical background, economical status, knowledge level, and the ability to perform self-care. Culture differences also have a lot to do with hygiene. Um, and the proper care of skin, hair, teeth, and nails protect the body against infection and from diseases. Now, when we're talking about planning um, a care schedule for hygiene for some of our patients, some people like to do early morning, some people like to do morning care, some people like to do afternoon care, and some people you know, like to do late care, but I'm gonna explain to you the importance of all doing um, hygiene all throughout the day. So let's talk about early morning. Um, so for your patient, when you're planning their care for the day, you're gonna do it several times a day. So the early morning care that you may want to do is offer them a bedpan or a urinal as soon as they wake up, um, help them wash their hands, help them to wash their face, provide some oral care for them, um, uh, and prepare them for tests or surgeries or anything that they may have as far as appointments or something like that earlier in the day. Now that's early morning care. Now let's talk about morning care. This is care that we're talking about after breakfast. So after breakfast, you may wanna offer them a bedpan or a urinal again, provide oral care because they just ate. Um, and you also may want to bathe them or complete do a complete or a partial bath. Um, a back rub is a good thing to do for morning care. Shave them, um, make sure they have hair care done, the nails are clean and um, taken care of and dress the patient. Please make note of that in the morning care because when sometimes when we say morning care, you may wanna do the bath uh, for the elderly people. People kinda of get confused and they're like, well, I normally do my bath at night. Well, we're talking about your aging population. For afternoon care, um, you should do care after they have any diagnostic tests done um, or if they've had to go see the doctor, offer them a bedpan or a urinal and provide um, oral care for them again because they've probably eaten snacks or lunch. And then uh, planning for care for the hours of sleep. You may want to offer them a bedpan or a urinal again, wash their hands and their face, provide oral care for after dinner, change them into their gown um, if, they're, if it needs to be. Um, another back rub will help relax them. And then you can adjust the patient's position in bed or, and position them for uh, sleep. Now some pressure um, ulcer risk factors that we notice with our um, aging population. 
Um, these patients um, who are at risk are patients who may be confined to a bed or a chair. They have the inability to move. They may have a loss of bowel and bladder control, so then they become soiled often without being cleaned up readily. They uh, may have poor nutrition, a lowered mental status, dehydration, obesity, an excessive sweating or diaphoresis, and extreme age causing fragile skin or you can even get um, have a risk for a pressure ulcer if you have edema as well so patients who are normally uh, paralyzed or they're unconscious or they have had some type of orthopedic surgery um, or a patient who has had a stroke or may be unconscious these patients are at risk for um, developing pressure ulcers as well in a healthcare setting, it is the responsibility of the caretaker to turn the patient at regular intervals and keep the patient's skin from shearing. Uh, keep them, prevent them from shearing forces, like when you're moving them or sliding them, okay? Frequent skin assessment is also very important for these patients. A loss of bowel and bladder causes the skin to become irritated and break down faster. The patient needs to be kept clean at all times, and we discussed this a little bit ago. Like you can never say, well, it can wait on the A to get there, or um, I could do it later, uh, I'm passing meds, or whatever like that. That is just as important as keeping your patient clean. Edema can also affect uh, a patient and can make them high risk for pressure ulcers because it interferes with circulation. Now let's talk about the stages of pressure, pressure ulcers. Stage one, um, the area is normally reddened. The skin does not blanch when it's touched. Um, the discoloration in people with dark skin, warmth, edema, or um, um, sorry, induration may be present for the stage one. For stage two, it will have that partial thickness skin loss, and it may look like a, an abrasion. It could look like a blister. It could look like a shallow crater, if you will, um, and it may be surrounding the skin, and it may feel warm to the touch. I want you guys to please make a note, highlight this. Ulcers form from local interference with circulation and skin does not blanch when pressed. That's how you know you're having a, starting a form of a pressure ulcer. Stage three is full thickness skin loss. It looks like a deeper crater and it may extend into the fascia. The fascia is connective tissue, okay? Subcutaneous tissue damage or necrosis may be noted. Uh, stage four is full thickness and skin loss. But this one has extensive tissue necrosis or damage to the muscle supporting structures and it may appear very um, dry and black. Now, it also per, per touch, these um, feel very different. Now, if we have a patient, like I said, on stage one, okay, um, this is one that's kind of sometimes people miss it, but I want to give you guys a hint. Stage one, when I say in duration, that is when the area feels hard. The area feels hard. That's what we call in duration. And that is a sign of stage one pressure. Press pressure ulcers. Press ulcer. Pressure ulcers. Now um, on your slides, I left you a couple of pictures of what a stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four looks like. Okay, so but we want to talk about um, the rest of them will continue. Um Eshgar. Um, is a word that I want you guys to kind of learn and know what that means. 
Eshgar is a build up um, of necrotic tissue. Okay, a pressure ulcer cannot be uh, accurately assessed unless the eshgar is removed. And when we remove eshgar, it is called a debridement. So if you hear somebody say they had their pressure ulcer debrided, that's what it means. They cleared out all the eshgar, and that is necrotic tissue. So let's talk a little bit about what we would do. Before stage one, um, suspected deep tissue injury, localized discoloration of intact skin that is maroon or purple or a blood-filled blister resulting from damage to an underlying soft tissue from the pressure or shearing, that's when you're sliding your patient. Um, this area may be painful to the patient. It could be firm, mushy, boggy, or it could feel warmer to the touch than normal or cooler to the touch than normal. When I say normal, I mean the rest of the skin. Um, um, now we have some that's called unstageable, an unstageable pressure ulcer. This is when you notice a loss of full thickness of tissue and the base of the ulcer is covered by eshgar. It could be tan, it could be brown, it could be black, um, and it would be that inside the uh, wound bed or the base of the ulcer, contain, and it would contain like sloth, okay, also. And sloth is like that yellow tan um, material. Sometimes it looks grayish or uh, greenish or brownish, okay, the sloth. Some of these are just the pictures, guys, that I already um, have in your slides. Now, there are some protective devices for pressure ulcers that could be used uh, that you may see in the hospital or in an elderly facility or during home health care. Um, heel protectors, sheep skin, water pressure beds, or air fluidized beds. All of those are really, really good to help um, distribute the weight uh, to decrease the chance of the patient getting a pressure ulcer and they also use these things when they're trying to heal the pressure ulcer to keep it uh, from reoccurring. So when we want to prevent pressure ulcers from happening, we want to assess the skin carefully and frequently. We want to change the patient's position at least every two hours and keep their heels um, of immobile patients from the bed, from just laying, shearing on the bed. Also, we're going to avoid positioning the patient directly on the trochanter, um, which is the side of the hip, because the side of the hip could be uh, very bony in some patients. Um, also, um, in order to prevent pressure ulcers, we will use a trapeze or use a, a lift sheet when we're moving patients um, or changing their position in order to not slide them. Also, when we want to prevent uh, pressure ulcers, we're going to give particular um, um, attention to your patient. Uh, bony prominences. They may be different places on different patients. So you're going to pay close attention to that. Uh, note them uh, when you are doing assessments on their skin. And you're going to note and chart any redness areas. Document them uh, carefully and document exactly what you see. Uh, for example, you would measure it. So you would say something like um, a two by two centimeter reddened area um, on the right ankle noted and it does not blanch to pressure so that way you're actually describing exactly what you're seeing so that now you guys can pay close attention to it and uh, pay close uh, care of taking care of it before it gets worse you want to go ahead and start healing it and then um, also we're going to do a lot of reassessing Later for reactive uh, hyper, um, hyperemia, that's excessive redness of an area. So we're gonna pay close attention to that as well. 
We're going to use pressure uh, reducing devices such as the foam pads and um, different specialty mattresses in order to prevent pressure ulcers. And we're going to use pressure reducing devices for the patients while they have to sit in chairs or sit in wheelchairs. Um, and then also we're going to help them and educate them to shift their weight at least once an hour, preferably um, more readily, like every 15 minutes or so while they're sitting in these chairs and in the wheelchairs. Uh, we're going to help restore circulation to the area by rubbing around the reddened area, not rubbing on it, rubbing around the reddened area. But we're going to make sure that we do not massage the reddened area or massage over any bony prominences. We're going to wash and dry incontinent patients promptly in order to prevent pressure ulcers. Avoid mechanical injury from casts, braces, things like that. Avoid skin injury, which can be caused by friction and shearing. And we're going to provide adequate nutrition and hydration to the patients. And sometimes when you're dealing with your elderly population, they don't eat well, they don't drink well. And sometimes that is because um, when they're alone a lot of times or eating alone, they just won't eat as much. So some things that are very easy that we could do to assist that is... Um, Maybe sit them with other people, sit and talk with them while they're eating, if they like to eat in their room or such like that. And also for those patients who don't drink a lot of water, don't leave them with a whole, you know, cup of water and then just give it to them, make sure for them to drink that. No, you're going to have to kind of come back and forth and make sure that they take a few sips every time you're there paying attention. And then also to prevent pressure ulcers, we're going to avoid burns and hot or cold applications to their skin, like um, heating pads, like cold packs, things like that. So we're going to minimize their skin injury, especially skin injury that's caused by sheer force. Sheer force, that just means like sliding. Remember that. And as far as their nutrition, it's always good that we make sure that they get enough protein in uh, because protein within their nutrition will help them and uh, help for healing. Okay, so now let's go ahead and start talking about uh, pressure ulcer treatments. What do we do if we know when we notice it? Um, and we're wanting to uh, get rid of some of those pressure ulcers, what do we do? First of all, excellent nursing care is the main factor in preventing um, any pressure ulcers um, to happen. And actually, it is a team effort. The nurse cannot handle it all by herself, but everybody who's working with the patient can. It's a team effort. Um, and the initial care of treatment of a pressure um, ulcer is debridement cleaning of the wound, and application of the dressing. Initially, um, care may, their initial care may require some antibiotics. It really depends. The Braden scale is used to assess the risk for skin breakdown, and the family and patients should be educated on how the pressure ulcers will or can develop. Surgery is required to repair some pressure ulcers if they are severe or if they become infected. And they use special dressings a lot uh, of the time on a pressure ulcer. That's called a TIL. It's T-I-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And this is a dressing for stages. Um, for stage one. Also, uh, you'll see duoderms used or wet to dry dressings. And sometimes uh, we're seeing a lot of different um, dressings and different methods of um, how to take care of this wound um, in facilities now. So you're going to see more than just the ones that I just listed. There are gauze dressings that are impregnated with saline uh, or possible medication, and that just means gauze that already have it in there. Whirlpool baths are sometimes used. Physical therapy or a wound care nurse um, 
sometimes will do the um, treatment. Uh, but some facilities that you work at, the nurse herself will do total care and she will do that treatment. Now some goals for um, a patient who may have a pressure ulcer, the goals or the expected outcomes. Uh, one of them could be the patient's skin integrity, integrity, integrity <laughs> will remain intact. The patient's hair is clean and neatly styled each day. The patient um, will not um, experience any um, pain and bony prominences. Now let's talk about some expected outcomes when we're just talking about the hygiene and the care of a patient. You could have an expected outcome of the patient's mouth is intact and free of odor. So there's a lot of expected outcomes that we can use when we're planning for our patient. Uh, whenever we're doing our little nursing process and we're planning, um, first for planning, you must do data collection. And we do data collection during the assessment of the patient. That's how we get our information. And so when we're doing our planning, we will write all of these things down um, in order to make our care plan. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the nursing process. The nursing process includes assessment, nursing diagnoses, and planning. Let's see here, okay. Now when we're dealing with a patient who we're doing total care on, and sometimes people tend to forget um, what all we need to do for these patients. And so when I teach a student um, about making sure your patient's ADLs are done, ADLs stand for um, active activities of daily living, ADLs, activities of daily living. And so I tell them to think of the word bat, B-A-T-T-E-T, batted. So when you think about a bat, when you're thinking about um, their activities of daily living, you think about batted. Okay, have I done all my things? Let me think about my acronym. My acronym is batted. And batted stands for bathing. That's what the B stands for. A stands for ambulation. T stands for transfer. Have I transferred my patient today? The other T stands for toileting. Have I toileted my patient several times today? The E stands for eating. Did I make sure my patient ate well um, and had things to drink so that they are well taken care of? And the D and bad it stand for dressing. Did I dress my patient today? It is very important that all of their um, activities of daily living are done every day, even when it comes down to the dressing. They are not to have on the same bed clothes that they've had on since they went to bed all day long. Okay, it's not conducive to their good health. Now let's talk a little bit about the bath. There are key points of bathing on skill 19-1. But some things I want to talk about when dealing with the bath is that we are to maintain safety while we are bathing our patients. Um, make sure the water is warm. Make sure that your room um, is warm, but not too hot and not too cold before bathing the patient. Make sure the side rows are up when you are away from the bed. And make sure the bed is in the lowest position available uh, before you leave the patient's bedside. Now, when we are giving a patient a bath, we wanna make sure that we are maintaining their um, privacy and also we want to maintain their safety and we want to make sure they're comfortable so another thing that I like to teach my students is, is that we want to prevent them from having chills when you are giving them their bath because you are wiping and making their skin cold and then leaving it up into the elements so I teach my students to cover the patient appropriately as um, needed. So you wash an area, you dry it, you cover it, okay?
Now there's four purposes in why we uh, need to make sure that our patients are bathed properly. Uh, one purpose is for the cleaning of the skin. Then we have to pro uh, promote comfort, stimulate circulation, and remove waste products from their skin. Okay, the patient should be covered to prevent them from chilling like we just discussed before. And the water temperature should be, you know, around 105, something like that. You don't want the water too hot, too cold. Now, when I say that we would like to provide privacy, um, that means shut the door, keep the curtain drawn if there's curtains in the room, put a sign on a door so that people don't just walk in because you know sometimes other healthcare team members are just walking in and out, in and out of the rooms. So what you could do is um, put a sign on the door to indicate that a bath is being given to help maintain their privacy. Um, drape the patient appropriately to um, one, prevent um, unnecessary exposure and two, that also will help prevent chills, okay? Now, when we're talking about um, cleaning the patient, the most um, and the bath, the most common type is done in the bed. Uh, so you can have a bed bath, or you can have a tub bath or a shower. Um, and before you give your patient a bath, period, regardless to what type of bath you're going to give them, offer the patient the use of the toilet, a uh, bedpan, urinal before setting up for the bath, because there's nothing worse than you. Um, getting ready to clean them up, getting them all set up for the bath, then they um, feel like they have the urge to go, and then now your water's gonna get cold because you're waiting, you know, no. You would give these uh, patients the ability to do that first, so that once you're, they've relieved themselves by toileting, then you give them their bath, um, and then they're comfortable after that, and not like, oh, they've taken their bath, now they have to go to the restroom and feel like they may need another cleaning up. Um, when giving them a bed, you may need to assist uh, the patients and they may have assistive devices such as a shower chair or a stool or a shower bench that's in the tub. Uh, but we do allow the patient to um, do as much of their bathing as they can, but you must maintain safety. It does give them um, some ownership and it makes them feel like they can still do some things on their own. Um, we normally give bed baths to patients um, who are unable to get um, in and out of the tub safely or unable to get a shower safely. Those are the patients who we normally give the bed baths to, okay? Now let's talk about um, perineal care for males and or females. So let's talk about the females first. Always wear gloves. Okay, wash your hands before you put your gloves on. Wear gloves, wash your female patients from front to back, and then make sure that you rinse and dry, um, pat dry totally, okay? Now for, and then take your gloves off, make sure you wash your hands. Um, for the male patients, you're going to wash your hands, wear gloves, and then make sure that you retract the foreskin and clean the head of the penis, rinse, and then replace the foreskin. If they have a catheter, wash around it with soapy water um, and rinse, regardless to if it's a female or a male. Now let's talk a little bit about therapeutic baths. So for therapeutic baths, we have the Whirlpool bath, and that is done in a special Whirlpool tub, and it's used to cleanse and stimulate um, peripheral circulation. We have the SITS bath. SITS is S-I-T-Z. The SITS bath, it applies moist heat and cleaning to the perineal area. Um, medication may be added to the water for a SITS bath. And then we have a sponge bath. A sponge bath is done to bring down a fever. So those are three uh, therapeutic baths. When we're talking about the therapeutic uh, bath that is the Whirlpool, the Whirlpool provides healing um, 
for the patient that is, and they are placed in a large uh, whirlpool bathtub and the warm water is, um, will irrigate and massage the skin. So to irrigate the area and it will massage the skin. And for a sponge bath, um, you know, to break down their fever, we make sure that the water should be tepid. Now on your slides, I did put some pictures of um, the different um, sits baths, whirlpool, things like that, okay? Please make sure that you read uh, the lifespan consideration. It's on page 302. Please read that. Portions of that reading is also on your test. Um, and we want to make sure that when we are bathing our patients that we are careful to protect and protect them from and prevent hyperthermia. Hypothermia is um, low temperature, low body temperature. And when we say low body temperature, we mean below 95 uh, degrees orally. And the reason we need to really, really be careful with hypothermia is because our elderly patients, like we discussed, they do have um, thinner skin. Now, when you are dealing with a patient who uh, may be able to uh, bathe themselves, you must always stay in hearing distance of the patient, uh, period. Uh, and you also stay within hearing, um, hearing uh, distance from a patient who has a history of syncope. Syncope is fainting, okay? So if you have a patient who you know has a history of fainting, um, even though they may be a walkie-talkie, that's what I call people that can kind of move around on their own, you still must stay within earshot so that you can hear them um, and so that you can kind of lay a close eye on them um, if they suffer from syncope, fainting. Also, those patients must limit their shower or their bath to about 20 minutes or less because this decreases the chance of them becoming lightheaded and... Um, when they become lightheaded, they can have a, um, it's because they are having some vi uh, vasodilation from the warm water. So we want to watch their water temperatures and watch how long they're in. Okay. When you're dealing with uh, the patient and their shower or their bath, their bath, like I was discussing before, we like to encourage independence um, and let them do as much as they can safely. Uh, but we will um, help provide range of motion or you know joints and uh, let them um, do some stuff on their own that does lift their self-esteem, helps them feel better about themselves. Even if your patient is paralyzed on one side, encourage them to use the other side. Encourage them to perform what they can on the parts that they can move. Normally when people just take baths, after their bath, they just feel more content, they feel more happy, um, which is why it's very important that we take that portion of our care for our patients uh, very seriously. I'm going to read you guys this little snip. Um, it's about Japan. Uh, in Japan, the main purpose of taking a bath besides cleaning your body is relaxation at the end of the day. The typical Japanese bathroom consists of two rooms, an entrance room where you undress and um, which is equipped with a sink and the actual bathroom, which is equipped with the shower and a deep bathtub. The toilet is located away uh, from that area completely. When bathing Japanese style, you are also supposed to first rinse your body outside of the bathtub with some water from the tub uh, using like a wash bowl. Afterwards, you enter the tub 
which is used for soaking only. The water uh, from the bath tends to be relatively hot, um, hotter than what Western bathing standards are. Um, and if you can barely enter, try not to move much since moving around makes the water appear even hotter. After soaking for a while, they leave the tub and clean their body with soap. Make sure that no soap gets into the bath water. Once they are finished cleaning, um, they rinse all the soap off their bodies and they enter into the bathtub once more for some more soaking. After leaving the tub, they do not drain the water since all the household members will use the same water. Now, you know, this is cultural. So, I mean, all we could do is just take this with a grain of salt. Does not mean that everybody within that culture does this or that it's done exactly the way that this is written. Modern bathtubs can be programmed to be automatically filled with water of a given temperature at a given time or to heat up the water to a preferred temperature. Now let's talk a little bit about the nursing process when we're talking about um, a few things dealing with bathing. So for assessment of the nursing process, bathing provides an opportunity to assess factors of hygiene, to assess skin condition, the ability to perform, perform self-care, and overall physical appearance of the patient. Hygiene as different in different cultures and have different views on bathing and hygiene. Your socioeconomic status may also affect the hygiene. We talked about that. Personal performance may affect hygiene. And self-care capabilities must be assessed for uh, cognitive functioning and physical functions. We must also assess factors such as range of motion, vision, muscle strength, coordination, and balance. This would be the assessment phase of the nursing process. The nursing process will be covered, you know, a little bit later, but I like to start teaching you guys and hitting on a few points. It kind of helps you when it's time for you to really retain it if you've already heard portions of it before. Now let's talk a little bit about back rubs. Back rubs to a patient confined to a bed. This is what we want. Oils, powders, and lotions may be used according to the patient's preference and their skin condition. We would want you to use more pressure on the upward stroke than the downward strokes. And they should be firm, but not so firm that the patient begins to tense up. Remember to move the patient close to you when performing the massage. Raise the head of the bed so you don't strain your back. And make sure you lift the bed up to working height for you. Your hands should be warm and relaxed before giving the back rub. Cool hands and cold lotion will cause the patient to tense up as well and it could make them feel chilled. An effective back rub should last about three to five minutes. An effective back rub should last between three to five minutes. Now, another thing I want you guys to remember when we're talking about uh, bathing our patients, it is very important to remember that even as adults, um, especially when they are more vulnerable or they have a feeling of loss of control, they um, will feel better physically and mentally if they are clean. Keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and discuss. So I'm looking at my clock when I get close to y'all like that. Okay, um, let's talk about routine care. Routine care is usually performed in the morning. It um, consists of bathing, a full bath, a partial, a partial bath, a tub bath, a shower bath, anything like that. Uh, um, perineal care, oral care, hair care, skin care, shaving, um, nail care. 
Oral care may uh, need to be performed several times per day, depending on the patient's condition, um, and performed on unconscious patients every eight hours. And people say, well, how do you perform oral care on an um, unconscious patient? Well, they have mouth swabs that you could use to actually care for their um, mouth, and also you should care for their lips because they could become very parched. And it also, um, we want to pay attention to our patients with dentures because they need oral care um, as well as the um, cleaning of the dentures. Now, when we're doing um, oral care, like I said, on an unca uh, unconscious patient, uh, we would like to use those moist uh, mouth swabs, and you should use it um, pretty often. Raise the bed to a comfortable position for you. I want you to always remember that's the first thing that you do. Raise the head of the bed. Position the patient in a lateral lying position nearest to you, and then lower the side rail. But anytime you leave the bed, you need to put the side rail back up. Uh, turn on the suction. Clean the mouth with two uh, those little toothettes or a toothbrush and paste and pay close attention to your patient's gums, roof to their mouth and tongue while you are um, doing oral care. Uh, you would rinse their mouth out with a syringe full of water and use suction to remove water or particles. Wipe the mouth clean and lubricate the lips with a water-soluble lubricant. So that is what we need you to do when you are doing oral care on an unconscious patient, okay? So when you're doing care on an unconscious patient, you must do that about every eight hours, but you can use those moist swabs for their mouth every two hours. Please note skill 19-2, it's on page 311 for that. Another part of routine care is their hair care. Um, brushing their hair, shampooing their hair, uh, doing their toenails, their fingernails. Um, if they are diabetic, you cannot do their toenails. Um, the diabetics require an order to have um, toenails done and a lot of times they're done by a specialist. You wanna also make sure their eye care is handled when you're doing routine care, like for the patients who need glasses, um, or the patients who may wear contacts, or patients who may have artificial eyes. And then also, you may want to make sure that for your patients who have hearing aids in, um, for all patients, make sure that you clean their ears, you know, wipe their ears with their little washcloth, uh, but then make sure that they do have their hearing aids in if needed. Now, the reason why for diabetics we do not cut their toenails, uh, and they may have to see a specialist for that, is because they are more prone to infection and um, their healing rate is very low um, or slow, so we do not want to uh, damage their feet because then, you know, once something on their foot doesn't heal, then they end up with problems and, and wounds and wounds that won't heal and some of them can end up in amputation and we're not trying to be about that life. Now here's some things I want you guys to remember. Remember when you're providing um, female perineal care, wipe from what? Front to back. And then make sure that um, the pubic area to the rectal area um, is handled correctly front to back. That's why you're doing that. And then make sure that air rinse properly and then pat dry. Another thing I want you to remember is when you're shaving a patient with a safety guard, um, oh, um, yes, shaving a patient with a safety guard is contraindicated if the patient is on an anti 
coagulant or chemotherapy or high dose aspirin or any blood thinner medications or if they are immunocompromised, okay? We do not want to shave these patients There has to be uh, great care taken uh, when that when they are um, having to be um, hairs having to be cut on their face or anywhere else. Um, also, another thing I want people to remember when it comes to their elderly patients, like uh, some of their elderly men, um, and some people feel like it's just easier to. Um, maintain cleanliness if they have a clean shaved face but you cannot take it upon yourself to shave a patient's beard or mustache off because you feel like it's easier and their food won't get caught in it and things like that you must get permission or consent from them or from their family members before shaving a beard or a mustache Now we're gonna go ahead and, um, yeah, I wanna hit just a few more highlights. Um, like when I was talking about uh, nail care, when I'm talking about nail care, I'm talking about um, maybe soaking their hands in warm soapy water uh, before cleaning under the edges of their nails. Um, and when we clean the edges of their nails, we try not to do it with anything super sharp. It's easier to do it with an orange wood stick. Um, and hospitals and elderly facilities have them. Um, if the nails uh, need to be cut, a straight cut uh, across will prevent them from getting an ingrown um, nail. And once again, do we ever, ever cut uh, diabetics' nails, toenails? The answer to that is no. They may have to see a specialist. Now, eye care, uh, we did discuss making sure they have their contacts, making sure that they um, have their glasses, you know, or if you're dealing with somebody with a false eye. But I also want you to know that you're to always remove their glasses carefully and wash their glasses with warm water and a soft cotton cloth. Um, never use a paper towel or a Kleenex on their glasses. And that's a step that some people miss. They will take off a patient's glasses um, to clean their face and then put these dirty glasses back on their faces. Okay, no, you must take special care to care for those glasses. Um, and you want to, uh, when you're washing their face, you want to observe their eyes and you're looking for crustiness or drainage so that you can clean that, clear that off. Never use soap on or around your patient's eyes. Um, wash the eyes with warm water from the nose to the outer area so we always clean from this portion here out. You're never just gonna wipe, wipe their eye like that, you know, because then you could be putting um, bacteria or um, crusties into their eye. So you're gonna always clean from the nose to the outer portion of the eye. Um, if you notice that they do have a lot of the crustiness around their eyes, um, you're going to want to uh, place a warm washcloth over their eyes first for a few minutes and then wipe it clean And then when you do that if you have to wipe again, you never use the same part of that towel ever you will have to um, Get another um, cleaning area of that towel to clean the eye each time never just keep wiping with the same portion of the towel Now, ear care, I want to just dive just a few little uh, things about the ear care. Um, do not place objects in their ear. We are not supposed to clean your ear with Q-tips, but people do it all the time. Uh, but it is not proper, and that's not what you're supposed to do because you're forcing the wax back into the ear, and you can actually damage the ear by doing that. So when you're caring for a patient, you never stick an object in their ear to clean. You just want to um, use a... Uh, damp cloth and just clean into the um, just clean into the ear and that's it and you want to take appropriate care of the hearing aids um, and then you want to um, 
make sure that there's no like wax and stuff built up into the hearing aid. You want to uh, make sure the batteries are working correctly and you want to protect them from damage when they're not being used and you want to put them away so that they are not lost. So they do not need to be lost and they do not need to be damaged because those hearing aids are very, very expensive. Now I'm gonna um, end this with giving you guys a few nursing diagnoses for hygiene and skin integrity problems, okay? Um, some nursing diagnoses could be a self-care deficit, okay, for bathing or hygiene, self-care deficit for grooming or dressing, mobility could also be one because they have impaired physical mobility, skin integrity, for risk for impairment um, of skin integrity, uh, nutrition less than body requirements or imbalance, you know, because if they have poor nutrition, and we discussed that, then their, you know, their skin is fragile, may not heal as well. Uh, pain, they may not uh, take good care because they're hurting. Tissue integrity impairment is another good one. Tissue perfusion ineffective. That's a, a one that you could see, a nurse diagnosis that you could see used for a lot of these situations. And also, uh, the last uh, one that I want to talk about, nursing diagnosis for hygiene and skin integrity problems, is self-esteem. And that's it. So, that's the end of this chapter. And you guys are over halfway there. Um, so keep up the good work. Make sure you're studying. Make sure you listen to me often. Bye.